Welcome. You are about to view a recorded talk of the Mathematical Consciousness Science online seminar series held in 2020. This seminar series aims to explore the role of mathematics in the scientific study of consciousness and hopes to connect researchers who have an interest in this topic. While every session of the seminar consists of a talk and discussions, the latter are not recorded and the following will only contain the talk. We hope you will enjoy it. For further information, please visit our website, seminar.math-consciousness.org. I'm delighted to be here today. Um, and so, yeah, I'll be giving you an opinionated introduction to phenomenology uh, geared towards consciousness researchers. Uh, phenomenology is a study of the structure and dynamics of consciousness. It's about a um, hundred year old uh, discipline. It has its origins in French and German philosophy in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, and I think it has a, a great deal to offer consciousness research. Um, and so I'm just gonna kind of give you a broad overview, a literal map actually in the next slide of the area. And then I'll kind of drill down into a few specific areas that I think are especially promising uh, for contemporary consciousness research. So uh, let's see. So this is a study I'm doing right now uh, with Pablo Contreras Collins at Cornell. This is a bibliometric analysis of the phenomenology literature. So it's really a literal map of phenomenology as, a, as an academic literature. And what this is, is a citation graph and each dot on the graph, each vertex, corresponds to one author, and then two vertices are linked by an edge if one author uh, cites another. So I'm some dot somewhere on here, and if I cite Husserl, there's going to be a link between me and the dot corresponding to Husserl. Uh, and so we produced this by uh, going to the Web of Science, a pretty big online database that has the uh, advantage of uh, citation entries also have contained citations to other works. And we got all articles about with the word phenomenology in their title, where the word phenomenology was being used in its philosophical sense, not in like a physics sense. Um, all articles that fit those criteria um, between 1900 and 2020, although most of the databases um, waited towards the last uh, 20 or 30 years. So we ended up with about 6,000 articles and the graph has about 12,000 nodes and 70,000 edges. And then once we had that, we're able to run different kinds of network analysis algorithms on it. And again, sort of achieve this kind of empirical view of this literature. And um, we ran clustering algorithms on it, also called community detection algorithms. And so the dots are colored by which community they're in. And so the big ones, as you can see here, are this one, which is associated with Husserl, Husserl was the founder of phenomenology. He's the one I'll focus on in this talk. Uh, Heidegger, who was a student of Husserl's, they had a big fight. That may be why there's all these, you can see the, the green is for Heidegger and then the green edges are like the ones are the outflow from Heidegger, the fan out, I guess you could say. Um, so you can see there's a lot of dialogue between these two. The, most phenomenologists or many phenomenologists are Husserlian or Heideggerians. This is a sort of major division in the field. And then there's this other one associated with uh, French phenomenology. Uh, Merleau-Ponty was sort of the big one there. Um, and that was kind of the second wave of research uh, after Husserl and Heidegger. Um, and then a lot of the rest of this uh, is stuff that's more recent. So in the last, you know, it was kind of consciousness was sort of off limits for a long time, especially during the middle part of the 20th century. But starting in the 1990s, it, it sort of came back into acceptable you know philosophical discourse and philosophers started talking about it psychologists started talking about it and so you had the emergence of consciousness studies and so then you started getting uh you know philosophy papers talking about phenomenology just meaning study of consciousness and so that's what this uh cluster is here and i'll, I'll say more about these in, a, in the next slide and then this is like uh dreyfus and varela a lot of embodied cognitive science that um, takes a lot of inspiration, especially from uh, Merleau-Ponty and Heidegger. So let's look at this a little more closely. So these are the top six clusters in the database. Um, and they are, uh, this table sort of shows how many uh, citations there are to somebody in that cluster, how many uh, authors are within each cluster and how many unique citing authors there are. So how many unique uh, authors cite somebody in each of these clusters. 
And I should say, I don't, I don't know if I mentioned this, but a cluster is, is roughly speaking, is a group of authors who cite each other more than they cite people and other authors. So it's a kind of natural grouping of the data. And so uh, these are the sort of most cited people. This is what I mentioned, this is a classic Husserl cluster. It's the biggest one in terms of number of citations, right? A pretty good fraction of every paper written on phenomenology uh, cites Husserl. Uh, followed by Heidegger, then the philosophy of mind one I mentioned, so you can see a lot of familiar names here, Fodor, Searle, McDowell, Chalmers. Uh, then what I called French phenomenology with Merleau-Ponty and Sartre at the top. Um, and so actually Husserl, Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty and Sartre are often considered the four canonical uh, original phenomenologists along with the Beauvoir. Um, uh, and then embodied cognitive science, you could see, uh, you know, like JJ Gibson is in there, Francisco Varela, these are kind of classic names in that area, Gallagher, and Dreyfus, who's a, a well-known interpreter of Heidegger um, and who connected it a lot with work in cognitive science. The Kant-Hegel cluster is interesting. Hegel wrote a book called The Phenomenology of Spirit, and I think that's part of why this showed up. Um, this, a lot of this is uh, Hegel scholars in here, or people obviously like Marx or the Frankfurt School inspired by Hegel. Um, and so you can see it's a little farther away, but even though it might be partially an artifact, uh, Hegel was a major influence in particular on French phenomenology. Heidegger was influenced by Hegel and all of them, Husserl by Kant. So you can see there's a quite a bit of interplay between uh, this cluster and the others. Okay, so I'm going to focus on Husserl. There's plenty to do. There's lots of work here. And so there's only seven days in the week. So I'm going to just emphasize Husserl. Um, and I've also sort of uh, draw inspiration from the work in philosophy of mind from some of the work here, especially Dreyfus's work and <clears throat> William James and Merleau-Ponty. But in this talk, I'm going to primarily focus on Husserl. Um, Okay, so Husserl was a mathematician by training. Uh, he, he worked pretty closely and was inspired by Weierstrass in the late 19th century. Weierstrass uh, is an important figure in the history of calculus, of analysis. He was one of the first to rigorously prove uh, or provide an epsilon delta definition of continuity. Um, he proved the intermediate value theorem. Uh, Husserl was also close with, he was like neighbors with Cantor at one point. Uh, Hilbert, I think, championed his case at uh, Göttingen, um, and he was influenced by Riemann. So a lot of philosophy or mathematics is in the background of Husserl's work. Uh, his PhD was on the calculus of variations and, you know, variational methods, of course, making a comeback in lots of different areas of uh, uh, machine learning, for example. Um, so that's his background. And then he came to philosophy and he thought the same kind of rigor that he saw Weierstrass bringing to mathematics with you know, rigorously defining things and so forth, he wanted to do for uh, philosophy. And he liked this kind of Cartesian project of uh, like putting all of knowledge on this secure foundation, right? So you remember Descartes in First Philosophy says, you know, I, I may not exist, I may be dreaming, I might be in the matrix. Uh, but I know what I can't doubt. The one thing I can't doubt is that I exist as a thinking being. And even if I am dreaming, I'm still having these experiences. And uh, Husserl liked that, but he thought it could be done in a much, in an even more rigorous way. And so he wrote about 42, there's currently 42 volumes in the Husserliana series, and there's more. It hasn't all been edited. I think there's about 40,000 pages. So real quick, this gives you a sense of just how much we're dealing with here, right? So if one dot here is associated with over 40,000 pages. And I mean, I think Heidegger, it's like 70,000 or something. And it's, it's not even all of it's out. Um, clearly, there's probably, you know, well over a million, several million pages of work in phenomenology. And it is the study of first person subjective experience. And so we've got like this giant database of uh, hypotheses about the structure of conscious experience. And so the, my kind of main meta argument is that we should be drawing on that as we develop our philosophical theories or models of consciousness. Okay, so, um, so he had this big Cartesian project and the basic, the intuitive idea is like any cat, anything you know about, anything that's real for you. Um, so, uh, table, you know, coffee cups, uh, tables, chairs, houses, uh, people, the people you know, the people you love, uh, institutions, uh, states, nations, churches, 
uh, mathematical theories, uh, atoms, quarks, posits of science, um, all of this stuff, right? Any kind of entity of any kind of any ontological domain is going to be ultimately, insofar as it's a thing for you, is ultimately going to be grounded in some pattern of conscious experience unfolding over time. So you only know about the cup by your various interactions with it, or you only know about quarks or muons or triangles by reading about them in, in books, by hearing lectures about those topics, by observing the results of experiments and experimental apparatuses, right? These are just so many experiences that get sort of pattern, you know, synthesized and coalesced together in a certain structured rule governed way to produce your sense of them. And so not just objects, but ultimately your entire sense of reality is gonna be founded in these structured patterns of experience. And he brought this mathematical sensibility to it. This is an example of one of his diagrams. So this would be an object like a house. And then each row of this matrix is gonna be one uh, pattern of bodily movements with respect to the object. So K is for kinesthetic. So like we have, this is one pattern of bodily movements or kinesthetic experiences. This is another, so this is like walk to the left around the house, walk to the right around the house, maybe stand still for a few minutes then walk in a diagonal pattern, right? There's gonna be all these different ways you can walk around the house. And then for each one of them, assuming the house doesn't change, a particular uh, sequence of uh, color experiences or visual images will occur. And this happens in a very structured way. It's a kind of thing like a 3D game program would have to program is rules to present images uh, based on the movements you take. And so he thought there was a structure to this, a mathematical structure that could be uh, studied and made rigorous and used to provide this massive foundation for the various domains of knowledge. Incidentally, the different volumes are about the different categories of being I mentioned, or a lot of them. Some of them are about methodology, but a lot of them are things like the phenomenology of the social world or the phenomenology of mathematics and logic, things like that. Okay, and I think again, so this is a precursor to this group, right? Mathematical consciousness science. Okay. So that's who's for role in phenomenology. And as we saw, there's a lot of this stuff. Um, and it was confined to philosophy for you know, most of its existence, but with the, the rise of consciousness studies and the reemergence of consciousness into intellectual discourse uh, in the 19, late eighties, early nineties, um, I don't know how to start. Maybe it starts around the time of like the Tucson conferences, something like that. Um, so with that uh, became a, a renewed interest in phenomenology and this work in naturalized or neurophenomenology. So in 96, uh, Varela writes this uh, paper, Neurophenomenology, a Methodological Remedy for the Hard Problem. And the big idea here was that was what I said, we should start um, incorporating phenomenological insights into the study of consciousness. Um, now there's been a lot, like initially, this is what I was, this is what I did in my dissertation on. And I was freaking out at first, like, oh my God, people are doing this idea I have. I remember this, this book came out right around the time I was finishing. And, um, but it ended up being a great thing. It gave me a lot of people to talk to. It opened things up and it made this kind of a legitimate topic. And of course, uh, in the early 2000s, we had uh, Gallagher launches the um, Phenomenology and Cognitive Sciences, a journal. And so, there's a lot of work now, like this is an accepted thing to sort of mix phenomenology with the cognitive sciences. And the approach I take, so this is in this paper, uh, is to just treat phenomenology, like there's a lot of these sort of, at times exaggerated methodological claims, but just treat it as this big database of defeasible claims about consciousness, right? So we've got like hundreds of thousands or millions of pages of theory describing like everything, the phenomenology of the body, the phenomenology of mathematical objects, as I said, the phenomenology of uh, psychopathology, right? Phenomenology of schizophrenia. We've got just like everything you could imagine, right? There's lots of different theories and models and accounts of particular domains of conscious experience. Very much elaborated, uh, very, um, a lot of detail again. And treat this as a big mine of hypotheses, right? All of these claims are um, defeasible. They, they're falsifiable. Um, some of them will sort of stand up to scrutiny, others won't. Some of them, I think, suggest ways to enrich existing theories like integrated information theory or predictive processing accounts. Um, others will, be, will have parts of them sort of trimmed off. And so I could think of this as a giant filtering operation. We take all this phenomenology stuff and put it through the filter of interaction with other approaches 
uh, to the mind, including empirical approaches. And then what will be left over is a sort of a bunch of useful um, information for the rest of consciousness studies. Okay, so that's kind of my broad approach. Here's another way of looking at it. This is the cognitive science octagon, sort of this, the insignia of the cognitive science society. These are kind of classical disciplines thought to inform cognitive science. So, you know, computer science, psychology, philosophy, neuroscience. And so I'm kind of wedging phenomenology into that. And I think other things, you know, statistics should be here. They have AI here, I said computer science. Um, and so, you know, we've got, let's say the CogSci polygon and let's add phenomenology to that. And then I think the approach to take is to take this big literature in phenomenology and then try to find clear formalizable claims. And of course, Husserl lends himself to that because he had this mathematical formal approach um, make them as precise and formalized as possible and then say, all right, what does this tell us? This is his account of the experience of it. What do we know about what's happening in the brain when we have that kind of experience? Or what's going on in behavior when we have that kind of experience? And, um, and then uh, based on that, there might be something that sort of falsifies some part of the phenomenological theory. Um, another part of it might be con confirmed. And we kind of go back and forth until we reach some kind of reflective equilibrium or convergence between these different areas. I mean, even without phenomenology, I think that's what happens between different disciplines in the cognitive sciences, but I'm just saying add phenomenology to the mix. And phenomenology, I think, does add something. There's a kind of a richness of first person detail and insight that you come up with different accounts when you're just purely in the armchair, as it were, uh, thinking about these different domains of experience. Mistakes are made, but a lot of richness is added, and I think it does oftentimes enrich the uh, non-phenomenological theories. Okay, so that's kind of the big roadmap of phenomenology and where I stand in it. Um, and so the plan for the rest of the talk is I'm going to give you sort of a brief background on Husserl's particular approach to phenomenology. There were huge debates about this. Not all the phenomenologists felt the same way. Heidegger in particular was a critic. Um, but I'll, anyway, I'll describe Husserl's method. And then I'm going to focus on two particular sub theories of Husserlian phenomenology. One is this field theory of consciousness developed by one of his students, Aaron Gervich, and then his theory of horizons and constitution, which is a big complicated set of ideas that I'll just give you a kind of capsule overview. And along the way, I'll, I'll mention connections to other cognitive sciences and the work I'm, I mean, I'm in a cognitive science department and I'm interested in pursuing um, sort of empirical and computational studies of some of this stuff. But my focus today is going to be just to give you the phenomenological theories. It's a biased uh, overview. I'm going to show you, present the theories as I interpret them. And if there's, of course, interpretive battles over all this stuff. But I'm going to try and present a clear and fairly visual kind of overview of these ideas. I actually um, uh, started working with a, a cartoonist. Um, and so I've got some new animations. And so I'll be sort of this cartoon introduction to these two parts of Husserl's theory. Um, so that's kind of new for me. It's kind of fun. Okay, and of course, I think you should, you, you'll you have your own ideas about these, what whether these ideas are true, or some parts are true, some aren't, how they're related to your own research, and, and later in Q&A or via email, I'd love to talk more about that. I'd love to hear what you think about these ideas. Okay, so some uh, initial stuff on the method. Uh, Husserl, uh, one of the, the basic things, he actually didn't use this throughout his career, career, but he used it in one of his major published book, uh, The Ideas, Ideas One. And it's the principle of all principles. And actually, even though he didn't always say principle of all principles, the idea is clearly there throughout his, his work. And this is the idea that when you're describing some aspect of consciousness, uh, describe it or accept it exactly as it is presented as being and only within the limits of how it is presented. Notice that I'm, I'm not directly reading. This is, he's, Husserl is not the best writer. I'm told not in German either and not in translation. <laughs> But I think he had good ideas. So um, anyway, uh, the basic idea here is just when you're describing a conscious experience, describe it exactly as it is. Describe it accurately. I mean, this is just obvious, right? Describe things accurately. But it was important for him to emphasize for consciousness because so much of the history of consciousness had been sort of influenced by other external philosophical ideas. And he said, just forget all that. Just take the experience exactly as it is. Take things as they are. And in particular, when you're deciding which, I mean, anything is up for grabs in phenomenology. I think Sartre famously, you know, got into it when somebody, they were drinking apricot cocktails 
and Raymond Aaron or somebody said, oh, you know, phenomenology is like a, you could have philosophy of apricot cocktails and Sartre ran out and bought this, you know, some Husserl book at that point. Because any moment of life, any moment of waking life, if you're awake and experiencing things, any moment of your life right now, right, this is phenomenology, this is experience. Um, so anything is open to phenomenological study, but Husserl wanted to focus on the everyday. This is a big theme, right? Is natural everyday experience, average everydayness, right? Um, lived experience in the natural attitude. And the idea here was to sort of uh, get away from unusual situations like Descartes uh, doubting the existence of the world, like maybe I'm dreaming, maybe there's an evil demon, or you know, you're sitting in a lab doing some introspective study uh, this is the time of Wundt and Titchener and introspective psychology. Um, and he said, no, just take uh, just everyday experience exactly as it is. And whatever uh, philosophical or intuitive or folk theories you have, whatever assumptions you make about the world, uh, don't like accept or reject them, just describe them exactly as they are, right? And so he's, and he says in the world of the natural attitude, for example, uh, we, we're, we're naive realists. We assume the world's out there. We don't doubt it. We assume it's endlessly spread out in space. It's, uh, it's got infinite extent, indefinitely goes back in time and will continue in time. Um, and it kind of goes on in this passage of all these things we take for granted about the world around us, that there's other people, that there's animals, that there's institutions that you're part of, uh, social groups and so forth. And all of those will subsequently become studies of detailed phenomenological investigation. So, okay, so we take some moment of everyday life and then he says, how do we study it phenomenologically? And he introduces this method of bracketing or what he also calls epoche. And the idea here, this is again, a kind of reaction to Descartes. He says, you're not gonna doubt the factual existence of the world like a skeptic. And again, like Descartes does. Descartes starts off and saying, suppose there's an evil demon deceiving me. Suppose I'm dreaming, what can I still know? And Husserl says, wait, the minute you do that, you're like creating this really weird state, right? Let's just take, again, everyday state and just put it in brackets, kind of press pause on it and then describe what, you know, then reflect on it and say, all right, well, what, what was going on in that moment? What was I taking for granted? What were my assumptions? And what are the components, the, the parts of that experience? And so that's the method of bracketing. And so actually one way to think of it, see people have done this, is to just take some moment and like you could even have a beeper, right? That just couldn't beeps off randomly at some point in the day. This is to get a random sample uh, for phenomenological investigation. And when the beeper goes off, uh, describe what you were experiencing, write it down in a, a notepad. This is called experiential sampling. Um, so I kind of like that, that gets at the idea. And so I did a little bit of quasi random sampling. I chose an example for my life that would be easy to film. So it was not random at all. I chose it, I selected it for that purpose. Um, so this is me like about a week ago making dinner. And so let's see what happened. So I was there. All right. So I'm, I'm slicing the zucchini for dinner. The rice cooker is happening in the background. And now, um, after a moment of this experience, I sort of press pause as it were, I put it in brackets and now what were, what are the parts and moments as he said, what were the, what are the components of the experience of this kind of arbitrary moment of uh, my life. And you could see sort of my visual experience is sort of centered on my cutting of this yellow squash, uh, but I've got some uh, peripheral awareness of the green squash, of the cutting board, of some moisture on the cutting board, of the, um, I've got even more peripherally some experience of this uh, rice cooker in the background. I had a sense of uh, my body, I had a sense of, okay, what do I need to do next? I need to get the grill pan going. I got to need to heat up the oil. Uh, there's kids in the background. Um, and, you know, I've got to get everybody corralled together for dinner and so forth. So this is all going on at this moment. And so you sort of, you could press pause as it were, put a moment of experience in brackets and then go to work sort of teasing apart all the structure that's going on there. I think there was also a lot, I smelled the, the rice was almost ready. You could see the, the, steam coming off of the rice cooker. Okay, so that's the big picture. That's the, the, the goal is to be able to, you know, describe these moments of conscious experience and tease them apart into all their different parts and structures. Um, all right, so now let me get to these two uh, sub theories of phenomenology I said to go over. And the first is uh, this field theory of consciousness, 
which is associated the work with the work of Aaron Gervich. Gervich was a, uh, he studied with Husserl. He was sort of one of the first generation of Husserl scholars. Like Husserl, he had a background in physics and math, and then he turned to philosophy and psychology. He wrote his dissertation uh, actually on, on Husserlian phenomenology and Gestalt psychology. Uh, Gestalt psychology is interesting because it was a, a strand of psychology that kind of arose in the middle part of the 20th century when at least in America, behaviorism dominated. And as I mentioned at that time, you weren't supposed to talk about internal states or certainly not consciousness. And, um, and yet Gestalt psychologists would look at, you know, take stimuli and say, well, what, what are you seeing, right? What is, what's the perceptual experience independently of the stimulus you were being exposed to? And so uh, Gervich actually thought this meant that Gestalt psychology had an implicit phenomenological reduction or bracketing operation. And, um, and so was one, he was kind of the first person to really connect phenomenology with uh, psychology, right? So he was an early naturalized phenomenologist in a certain sense. Um, he, uh, he lectured, so as, you know, he had this, this very storied history. He, um, as the National Socialists were taking over in Germany, he fled uh, first to France, where he lectured on Gestalt psychology at the Sorbonne. And Merleau-Ponty took those, uh, attended those lectures and learned about Gestalt psychology through Gervich. And I think Gervich was always kind of mad that Merleau Petit became this major figure and only like cited him once or twice in his major book, The Phenomenology of Perception. Anyway, so he went there and then, then he came to America to the new school, the University of Exile, where many other exiled intellectuals went and uh, uh, completed his career um, here in America and influenced to Her Hubert Dreyfus, who was my teacher. So I guess he's in my lineage. Um, Anyway, so he wrote this book, The Field of Consciousness. And I got to say, when I first, I got into phenomenology through Dreyfus, and Dreyfus was very clear. Um, and we would always fight and stuff. I, would, I was always disagreeing with him. And he, at one point he said, well, you sound like a Husserlian. And I said, okay, well, then I'll look into Husserl. And I started reading Husserl. And I couldn't read Husserl at first. This is an important point. If you're going to use this stuff, I recommend the secondary literature, unless you want to be a pure phenomenology scholar because a lot of it's very dense and weird to read. Certainly Heidegger is pretty strange. Um, and it, it's, it's hard, right? It's, it's sort of like a full-time job learning these languages. But Gervich, then I found Gervich, who Dreyfus told me about, and it was like wonderfully clear, right? So it was, it was my first example of clearly written phenomenology. Um, but anyway, so this became my entry point to phenomenology. And I still to this day, I've always liked this field theory of consciousness. So here's how it goes. It's this kind of, if you press kind of pause on a moment of consciousness, like me making the zucchini, the idea is, is that there's three main components to a given momentary state of consciousness or what Gervich calls a momentary field of consciousness. And there's this focus or theme. Uh, so in the zucchini example, it's my cutting and trying not to hurt my fingers, right? Like to adequately cut these uh, zucchini slices, that's a theme. And then the thematic field, so there's two kinds of then peripheral content, a thematic field and a margin. And the thematic field is all the stuff that's not at the center of your attention, but that is what he says is relevant to what's at the center of your attention. So it's sort of at that moment, like other things that I need to have access to, like I've got to be able to, um, uh, you know, I, I'm aware of the rice cooker and where things are at with that. I'm aware of the oil heating up. I'm aware of the next piece of zucchini, right? So these are all things that are kind of on this immediate periphery that are sort of accessible and that I'm interacting with and moving between pretty rapidly as I complete my task. So this is this sort of theme thematic field complex is sort of the thing kind of occupying you. But he says, in addition to that, there's other stuff, right? You don't stop being aware of the rest of the physical world, like the room I'm in. Maybe there's kids playing behind me. Um, you, you don't lose awareness of your body. You still have a sense of yourself as an embodied being. Maybe other thoughts are going on like, oh yeah, I've got a meeting later or I've got to work on that paper or something, right? So there's all this other stuff in addition. Here's a quote, he liked, uh, Gervich liked mathematical examples. So he's got these examples of you're sitting in a room or walking down the street thinking about a mathematical theorem. And he says, on the one hand, in an implicit, indistinct, dim and penumbral manner, you have a sense of references to possible solutions or to directions in which a solution might be found. So this is like you're trying to solve some puzzle, uh, solve some equation, deal with some bit of algebra. Um, hmm, what could I use the, what formula could I use? Is there some factoring trick, right? You're kind of scanning your mind for these options of how to solve it. 
And he says, but while you're dealing with the problem, you also have some awareness of your actual environment, of the room you're sitting in, the things in the room, and again, your body and so forth. So that's the big picture. And now I'm gonna show you some of my first cartoons, these new cartoons uh, made by Soraya Boza. I wanna give a shout out to her. Um, and they're gonna describe uh, sort of, well, here's the first one. This is kind of a way of thinking about what the field of consciousness is. Is there some theme? And then there's these different contents in the thematic field labeled TF and these different marginal contents like kids in the background, music is playing. Maybe I've got a, a itch on my, uh, toe or something, the mosquitoes are out in Merced now. So actually, I do have a, literally an itch on my foot. Um, so um, this is how I'll represent it. And what Gurbich said is that there's two main kinds of field transition, he called field transitions, where either something in the thematic field becomes thematic, and then whatever was previously thematic recedes to the thematic field, right? So um, I'm, I'm working on one zucchini, or I'm cutting the zucchini, and then I, I turn my attention to the rice cooker, and the zucchini cutting station then recedes to the thematic field. Uh, so that's one. And that's got a sort of character of smoothness and naturalness because you're staying within a task. And then is, there's also a marginal to margin to theme transition or marginal intrusion where something captures your attention uh, or you turn your attention to something. I mean, I think it could be exogenous or endogenous um, in this margin, right? So some music um, that you really like comes on and I pause and listen to this passage of great music or something. Then that comes in and becomes its own theme thematic field complex. So this first transition is illustrated here, right? So these thematic field items uh, come in. So I'm again, tending to the rice cooker uh, and now I'm gonna go back to the zucchini, right? You get the idea or I'm thinking about the theorem and then I try applying this factoring trick. All right, and then as that's happening, of course, you know, maybe uh, some uh, music comes on in the background uh, here and pops up. So other things are coming, coming in and out of the margin. Maybe you don't normally feel that itch in your foot, but for some reason, the way you move, it suddenly comes to prominence. Um, so there's kind of, again, this dynamic aspect to the field. And he really did think of it on a physics analogy of a kind of total connected um, structure where each part kind of influences the other, but where it's, it's got some substructure, right? There's real difference between the thematic field and the margin. All right, and then here's this marginal intrusion idea. So um, something like, the, again, the music in the background captures my attention and then it becomes its own, uh, I can only look at this one for so long, it gives me a headache. So let me just go to this still, right? So something marginal comes in to become thematic. And when that happens, it becomes its own, like now the music, what was marginal becomes a theme. And then I'm like uh, enjoying like this one part of the music, thinking of related music, telling myself, oh, maybe I should get another, you know, later on listen to this other thing by the same artist, something like that. All right. So again, this thing that was marginal now, I take a pause from cooking and then allow the music to envelop me. Okay. So these are these two kinds of uh, field transition. And so to give you an example, I'm just starting this now with a graduate student here. Um, oh, it looks like a slide got out of order, so apologies on that. Um, so um, we uh, actually got a grant to get a VR system, which we now have, and it's like the worst kind of experiment to try and do in COVID, because you can't do it on like online, but uh, maybe there's a way, I don't know. Anyway, um, so we've got this VR system and we want to actually look at, um, you know, ways of experimentally testing this claim that uh, Gervich has that theme thematic field transitions are smoother than uh, marginal intrusions. And so we've got this uh, game we're building where you have instructions to build like a, you know, a certain kind of structure and it's going to be hard enough and hopefully engaging enough that you sort of become engrossed with this task. And so the, the different shapes you're looking at are part of the theme and thematic field. But then occasionally this other thing comes up, like you got to empty a trash can or you got to refill some energy and you got to stop what you're doing and then, uh, and then move over to that. And now there's this whole literature now, and a few of my colleagues here at Merced are really into this, of uh, behavioral signatures of dynamic complexity. And, and like um, a system has like these, this integrated dynamical properties uh, will exhibit certain kinds of behavioral uh, characteristics that could be um, identified in behavior. So people look at power laws, one over F noise, pink noise in particular. Uh, there's something called dynamic 
uh, fractional analysis, I think it is, or dynamic fractal analysis. So there's a few of these techniques that we're looking at, and they've used to study things like uh, when you're solving a, you know, a gear problem and you have a moment of insight, um, the eye movement pattern will exhibit one of these shifts. So there are examples of people using these uh, behavioral measures to look at these kind of shifts in the organization of your cognitive system. And so what we're hypothesizing is that when we're in a theme to thematic field transition of the kind Gervish described, we'll have uh, the, the cognitive system will be relatively um, organized and that'll be reflected in the behavior and that there'll be something like a phase transition or a shift in organization when this marginal intrusion occurs. Okay, so that's an example of uh, taking this idea from phenomenology and trying to test it. All right, so that's the first kind of area of phenomenology I want to look at. And the second is Husserl's theory of horizons and constitution. And um, the big picture here is that, first of all, it's a major area of Husserl's thought. It's very uh, evocative and interesting. And um, I think there's a lot of potential in it. Um, so the, and the, there's a lot of concepts mixed together. And there's a lot of work to be done kind of cleaning it up. And I've done some of that work myself, as I'll say in a few slides. So I think the starting point for this would be his concept of an inner horizon. And the idea here is that you never see objects in profile, right, or, or by themselves, right? You never just see like a cup. When I look at this cup, I don't just see like this shape, this cup shape. I see this as the front of something that has a backside. And of course, I could turn it around and see that backside. Uh, I don't see the front of a house as like a, a facade. I see it as the front of a house that has a backside and inside and so forth. Even if I'm at a movie set, at like a studio, and I see a facade, I see it as something that has wood on its backside and planks and so forth. So um, an object is only ever given, right, uh, from a perspective. And the rest of it, like the rear side, the interior, are in some implicit sense, uh, like informing your awareness. You're not explicitly thinking about them, but they structure your sense of the object. Um, and so uh, Husserl introduces this concept of like uh, a manifold of uh, different perceptions of the same object, all differing in content. So he calls this an inner horizon. So the set of all possible experiences, I could have this of this cup where there's some path between my current perception and I move it to some other possible potential perception of it. Um, this is a lot like, uh, you know, um, the concept of a sensory motor contingencies in an active cognition. Um, and I think people in working in that area, as we saw on that map, have drawn inspiration from the control on this. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Whoops. Um, and sort of Husserl goes on, he says, like if, like, if you look at a box, for example, you have a sense of the interior of the box. And that sense is like, depending on how well you know the object, right, you're going to have a more or less definite sense of what's inside of it. If it's a box you look inside every day, you're going to have a clear sense of what's going to be in there when you open it. And if it's a box somebody just gave you for the first time, you're going to have much less of a sense of what's inside of it. Um, and he says, so this indeterminacy about the rest of the object has these different tints and grades, as he says. So there's this sort of structured, sort of more or less familiar kind of um, indeterminacy of the object. So I mentioned I formalized it. This is uh, from a book I wrote on the topic on kind of formalizing Australian phenomenology. So if I'm at the front of the house, having a visual experience of it, then relative to any particular sequence of bodily movements, there's gonna be some probability distribution over subsequent vis visual images. And my sense of the house as a whole is in a sense constituted by this structure relating bodily movements to expected visual experiences. Um, so this is just to say the stuff can be formalized. Um, and that I think is a good preliminary to integration with other cognitive sciences. Okay, and he says, not, this is all stuff on like, what constitutes our sense of a particular object. But of course, you don't just have a sense of the rest of an object, you have a sense of the rest of the world, right? So there's also this outer horizon. So there's the hallway beyond. Uh, like whenever Husserl was writing this, he must have been in a place that had pillars outside and stairs. And beyond that, you have a sense of the city you're in. And so right now, all of you watching this, right? You, you're seeing me, you're seeing my image on this uh, computer screen, and you have a sense of the rest of your computer, but you also have a sense of where you are. And if you walked out of the room you're in, what would be outside? And what, you know, where are you in relation to the world? In relation to California, you've got a sense of where you are positioned with respect to me. 
And at least in your immediate surroundings, you could in you know, mind, like imagine if I went out there, this is what I'd see. And then as you go further and further out beyond what's familiar to you, it becomes less and less determinant. Um, from this, Husserl builds up a theory of what he calls constitution or constitutive phenomenology. He says, we can in our minds kind of explicate or unfold these potentialities of consciousness. So like, I have a sense of what the backside looks like. That's like a, I can now think, what do I think is the backside like? And then if I wanted, I could then go actualize that potentiality. So we can kind of unfold these horizons as it were in imagination. And then we could then think about these rules that structure how these experiences have to hang together if the world is the way we assume it to be. And so this becomes the problem of constitution, right? That the study, the intuitive surveying and seizing upon theoretically of these regulated rule governed series of appearances that necessarily belong together in order for things to appear as they do. I like to think of this as kind of like if somebody's making a 3D video game program, like somebody, the, the author of a game engine, they have to encode rules that say how as you move different objects will behave. And once you've got all those rules, you've got kind of the rules of that game engine. Maybe it's not like a normal physics that's got some weird, like uh, what's the, uh, what's that uh, battle royale? Fortnite, right? I mean, there's some Fortnite physics, right? And so you can imagine being a philosopher stuck in Fortnite and then the phenomenological like project of that would be figuring out what the Fortnite game engine programmers did. Well, what Husserl is doing, he's like, well, we could figure out what like the, you know, quote unquote game engine of our life is, right? What are the sort of structures that determine the way objects appear for us and that determine how appearances will unfold relative to our bodily movements in the world. And he thinks there's going to be different like sets of programs, different like modules of the code, as it were, for different kinds of objects, physical objects, uh, other animate beings, right? Um, institutions, abstract objects, theories. He's got a phenomenology of theories and so forth. Okay. So uh, we, and what we end up doing is we kind of build these like giant systems of possible experience, right? So this is my actual experience of the cup now is embedded in a system of other possible experiences of the cup, other experiences of what's in the next room over, what's outside on the street, right? These are all potential experiences, many of which I will later actualize. So the world as a whole becomes this sort of big structure of possibilities or possibilia, right? Um, and so we get this structured manifold of possible experiences, something like uh, a structure inside of a state space in dynamical systems terms. And so that then becomes Husserl's way of modeling our sense of the world, of, of sort of introspectively modeling it. And once you have that in place, right, that in our heads, we've got a kind of model of our reality, a model of our world that we move around in, then we could talk about what it's like moving through that model, right? And he says, as we move through the world as we know it, the world as we uh, understand it to be in the natural attitude, we're constantly uh, making these implicit expectations, right? So as I turn the cup around, I've got this more or less sense of what it's gonna look like on its different sides. And those implicit expectations are for the most part confirmed. Um, and he says, when that happens, we have an experience of fulfillment. And fulfillment is just kind of this default mode or things are as you expect. You, you really don't take any extra notice. The world is continuing to be as you expect it to be. So when the melody begins, it stirs up these implicit expectations. He also calls them protensions or adumbrations. And those expectations find their fulfillment in the melodies unfolding. Now, sometimes these anticipations are frustrated and we have to update our model. Uh, maybe there's a, you go out in the hall and there's a copy machine that you weren't expecting out there and then you update your internal kind of model of the situation and you're not surprised when you go out again. Now, this has obvious relevance to the predictive processing framework. And I think there's a lot of interesting uh, work to be done connecting Husserl with that. Some of that work's happening. There's people looking at this, and I, but I still think there's a lot more to do. It's a very interesting topic. Okay, so now I wanna talk about how could we uh, do this kind of bridging operation, uh, this naturalized phenomenology kind of work on this theory. And what I think is interesting here is that, I mean, in imagination, I could sort of spell out a little bit of my world and how I imagine it to be. Um, but you're not going to get very far with that. But we could actually like produce a literal picture of a horizon, I think, 
Um, and let me show you how I think that would work. So I'll start off again with a cartoon. So we've got like this unfolding field of consciousness and we could think of is that at any moment, your current field of consciousness is one point in a space of possible fields of consciousness. So like at any moment, if we pause this, right, this would be one point and then we could record every point that unfolds over time and build a kind of map, right? We could build a structure showing all the different fields of consciousness that have occurred over time for some agent and get a picture kind of like this where the dot corresponds to the current location in this map. And then all the other dots are like past fields of consciousness, past experiences that have occurred. So we can imagine in my uh, zucchini example, it's like, all right, now I'm cutting the zucchini and those are all kind of similar to each other. And now I move to the rice cooker and work on that for a little bit. Then I get the grill pan ready and then I throw it on the pan to sizzle. All right, so we could, if you sort of think that like, and this, again, we could look at this now literally if we could create these kinds of maps like what is the structure of one of these horizons maybe they have these kinds of this kind of clustering properties where when you're around different objects those objects are similar those situations are similar to each other and that would be reflected in our experiences being similar to each other and so we capture for example metrical properties of qualia space using this kind of uh, approach this is a pure cartoon by the way this is like taken this is like a geffy example image and then we just animated on top of it. So I'm, I'm sort of making hypotheses by cartoons here, phenomenological hypotheses using cartoons. Okay, so let me say a little more about this. Um, the idea I have is that we start with some phenomenological hypotheses about the structure of horizons and how horizons, like whether you're in, for example, a, a densely, you know, a complicated horizon where it's something you know a lot about versus something sparse where you don't know much that's going to influence the nature of your experience, according to Husserl. Husserl talked a lot about this. How can we then test it and, and study it more concretely? And uh, here, I think we need to go to these other sort of nodes in the cog psi polygon. So we could sort of assume, and this is a big topic in consciousness studies, right? That uh, all different conscious experiences will have some different basis in the brain. And of course, different, when you're in different conscious states, your behaviors will be different. So we could take different brain states or different behaviors as proxies for the conscious state you're in. And if we allow that move, right, that behavior and uh, brain are proxies for consciousness, then of course we could measure sets of brain states over time or measure behaviors over time or create a computer simulation of brain states of a simulated agent over time. And once we've got something concrete like that, we could actually create one of these quote unquote horizons or cognitive maps and then take that to be um, a kind of a correlate, an isomorphic correlate of a, a horizon, right? A set of possible experiences that you actualize over time. This is an example from SimBrain. This is my own neural network software that I built initially to look at these ideas in Husserl, but it sort of took on a life of its own and is now um, also just a pedagogical tool and to some extent a research tool in neural networks. Um, and so this is a simulation where we've got a, an agent and it's got three sensory neurons. And as you move it around, I'll move it around the different neurons. Um, there's projections to this recurrently connected bank of Kuramoto oscillators that have their own intrinsic dynamics. And so then the external inputs will perturb those dynamics. And at any point, there'll be some pattern of activity across these 50 nodes. That's a point in a 50 dimensional space, which we could then project with dimensionality reduction, in this case, PCA down to two dimensions. And so I'll show you a few minutes or a few seconds of this, right? So we move it around the Swiss cheese and then we move it around the fish and we move it around the flower. You can see there's different activation patterns. And uh, these are the resulting um, states of this network. And you can see there's this kind of map with these three clusters, Swiss, fish, and flower. And this is kind of in the middle when it's not sensing anything. So this is the approach I have, the idea I have. And um, I'm just going to uh, describe a few hypotheses here. Um, and this is a lot of this is pretty wide open. This is stuff I'm just I just got a few new graduate students that so will be working on this. So this is uh, early days of this research. Um, so I'm even even like the hypotheses aren't fully fleshed out yet. Okay, this is brand new work, and I'm curious what you think of it. Um, so I'm going to just focus on the, a distinction that's in, it's in Husserl, but I'm this is Husserl as elaborated by me, um, and I'll, I'll call it the distinction between articulated and empty horizons. And it's purely on phenomenological grounds, 
you can imagine the difference between being in a place where there's many paths forward in one of these horizons, where you know what's around every corner, like being in a familiar neighborhood or in, in action, like cooking something, create, I made that zucchini dish a lot. So you kind of, or making an omelet if you're good at you know, cooking eggs, right? Or, or riding a bike. And in these cases, or talking about something familiar to you, you could react to many variations in a situation. If you're in a familiar neighborhood, you could uh, get home through many different paths. Uh, how am I doing on time? I don't, I'm running out of time, aren't I? Okay, I think I got about five more minutes, thanks. Okay, all right, cool. Um, all right, so if you're in a familiar environment with a sort of a richly structured or what Husserl calls a pre-delineated horizon, then you have this kind of reactive ability to respond to different variations in a situation. Your experience is gonna be primarily fulfillment, like you're just gonna, it's like kind of a neutral default, like things are as I expect. Um, and you're going to be able to, if you did this uh, phenomenological horizon analysis thing, you could imagine forward in many directions. So my horizon for the city of Merced is pretty rich. So I could imagine in my mind, I could drive around Merced. If one street was blocked, I could easily, without my computer, find an alternate route. Um, and actually, when you're doing something, these familiar things where the horizon is richly structured, there's actually less content in the thematic field. This is actually my own elaboration. Uh, you kind of go into this like flow zone um, where you know what you're doing and so you don't have to imagine all these sort of peripheral possibilities as much. Um, now when you're in, in a new area or you're learning some new skill, the horizon is emptier, right? And you so you're unfamiliar, you're learning something new, you're not going to have the same kind of experience of fulfillment, although you won't necessarily be surprised, right? You sort of expect yourself not to know what's going to happen. And I think this is, again, this is a contribution of predictive processing, this concept of uh, precision. Um, but anyway, I'm, I should stay within the phenomenology. Uh, well, that is the phenomenology, right? Even though it's new, it's not that you're like totally surprised all the time. It's just you don't know what to expect. And so you don't have this comforting feeling of fulfillment. And unlike in the articulated or rich or predelineated horizon, uh, in this empty horizon situation, you don't know, you can't imagine, like if I get dumped off in a plane or I just get off the freeway in the middle of South Dakota, I've never been there. So I don't know what to expect around every corner. I have some generic expectations based on similar cities, but I don't have specific expectations. And that's got a different kind of phenomenology. And I think that as in these kinds of situations, your thematic field becomes more active, right? Like if you're working on a problem you've never thought about before versus a simple one, or you're finding your way around a new area, you're, you're, you're more hesitant, like, wait, do I do this? Do I do that? And so these different possibilities, I think, pop up more in this uh, thematic field. Okay, so that's the sort of uh, phenomenological claims about these two cases, the rich versus a thin horizon or articulated versus an empty one. And so this is, again, hypothesis by cartoon. So I think in the articulated case, where you're sort of moving through a part of the map that's already got a lot of uh, states in it, right? So again, I, I already talked about these. A, a cognitive case would be discussing something you're familiar with, like where's a good place to eat in Merced? I've had that conversation before. Uh, it feels very natural. Or a, I've used the example before of a professor of, uh, um, I don't know, I always say Russian history, right? So, so a professor of Russian history, you ask any question, any elaboration, how does that connect to the such and such literature? Uh, she's going to be able to just fluidly go off and follow that path because she's operating in this densely connected horizon where she's gone down all those paths of thought before. Or in cooking, I've dealt with it when the pan was sticking or when there was uh, a bad vegetable or you know all these different contingencies I've dealt with before. The paths are already there. And so it all is much more natural and fluid and flexible. So some predictions are if we actually now, I should say, if we're going to actually try and test this, what are some things we could do? Some things I'm thinking of would be, so reinforcement learning sim simulations would be a natural one for a simulation example. Um, so, you know, an agent learning its way, uh, learning a policy to get around in an environment, and then looking at that data. Or behaviorally, we could build like video games um, where you have to learn your way around some, you know, area. And uh, it's a new area for all the players in the game, and then we compare there's gonna be some task, and so we could operationalize uh, how familiar it is just by you know, how well you do it, at your, your accuracy or your points. And so you've got some task in some game area, 
and you either you learn the map and then we can compare people who are brand new who just starting the game versus who have played it for a while and gotten pretty good at it um and then what we could do is we could um you know measure their bodily movements their mouse measure their the mouse position of the mouse they're using uh put on goggles and measure whether to do eye tracking or put an eeg cap on them and measure their brains in every case we'll get uh, continuous time series data of some dimensionality like if we had you know 50 put electrodes on them and what's their body doing as they do something um like an emotion lab and so if we had 50 electrodes we'd have 50 uh, streams of data 50 channels and at any moment there'd be some point in a 50 dimensional space that we could then plot so there's all ways we can in real tasks create um behavioral or neural or stimulated uh cognitive cognitive maps or maps using those kinds of data now then the claim based on the phenomenology is going to be that i mean some of this is just obvious but i'm going to put it up here just to sort of get the idea out that if you're in an articulated horizon so somebody's doing something where they're doing it well right you're doing well at the video game whatever that they'll be in a part of the map with high path density um, if we uh, trained a sort of one-step predictive model on one of these, uh, there's this prediction that we'll have low prediction error. The model, these will be predictable paths uh, if we trained a model on it. If we asked the participants in these experiments, we assume they would report confidence, they'd, they'd, uh, they'd be fluent, they'd just be behavioral fluency. Some of this, those signatures of integrated dynamics I mentioned before, like 1 over F noise, uh, presumably would be in play in when you're doing something familiar. And the paths I think followed would be in a sense more direct. Now there is a literature on this, like in problem solving, when animals solve a problem that's familiar to them, they take direct, they like, ah, I know how to get the bananas and they go straight there. Whereas if they don't know how to do it, they're like, oh, what do I do? You know, they're not taking a straight path, right? There's this more high curvature kind of and more turns. And so there must be some way I think to operationalize that. And I think it might be manifested even in these abstract kind of maps. That they'd be let, they'd be more direct in this articulated case. Now, in the inarticulate, and then we've got this sort of these are the the red thing is supposed to be the predictions made, and there's just a narrow, precise, right, more specific. I should put that down. There's more specific set of predictions um, as we move through it. In the uh, empty horizon case, it's like we're adding to a map. It's something we've never done about done before. We're learning a new skill. Like for me, like I, I had to sharpen my knives. That was something I had never really been very good at. Or if I had to cook something new like flan, I've never done that. Or talking about something you've never talked about or you don't have a lot of experience in, like some a political uh, policy that you don't know much about. Or again, getting off the plane in a new country or getting off the freeway in a new area. These are all places where you don't know what to expect and so you're adding to your cognitive map. And here the predictions, would, I've already kind of gone over them. You'd have less path density, like when you're first learning to play one of these games. Uh, the statistical model would make more errors uh people would have more hesitant speech in that kind of a task and actions they'll probably report less familiarity those signatures of integrated dynamics would be reduced and in whatever sense i previously was talking about more direct path the, the paths would be less organized it'd be like an animal not sure how to solve a problem flailing around like unsure trying things out with hesitance and so forth so that's it those are the two areas of phenomenology you want to cover um, let me acknowledge a lot of help on this. Uh, uh, Pablo Contreras Collins for the bibliometric study of the phenomenology literature. Soraya Boza for the cool animations. Uh, ben Fallende is the one doing the virtual reality study. And uh, these are uh, current and current and upcoming graduate students I'll be working with who uh, looked at earlier versions of this talk and provided some helpful feedback. That's it. Thanks a lot.